desire to look up and out is as old as we are and universal. When we look at the night sky, we see points of light. But with even a simple telescope, we see that while some of these lights are single stars, others are galaxies, swarms of billions of stars bound together by gravity. Today, armed with high technology, astronomers have seen further, deeper into the sky than ever before. Their telescopes have captured wonderful visions of the universe, of the galaxies, of the stars, dust and gas that make them up. These pictures tell us about the structures of things in space, about their temperatures and about the chemicals they contain. They show us that the universe is violent, colourful, extraordinary. But they don't tell us the whole story. The creatures of the cosmic zoo have other hidden faces. As well as the light we see, they put out other invisible radiations, gamma rays, X-rays, waves of infrared and ultraviolet, and radio waves. Of all these, radio waves have been studied the longest and have told us the most about the universe. Once captured and turned into pictures, radio waves have extended our view of the universe, our understanding of the way matter and energy interact. Often they show things completely hidden from the eye. To catch radio waves and turn them into pictures, you need special instruments, such as the CSIRO's radio telescope near Parks in central New South Wales. This telescope started work back in 1961. It's been upgraded several times and is still very useful, but it can no longer keep up with the ever-increasing demands of radio astronomers. Today, those demands are met by CSIRO's Australia Telescope, the best radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Australia was one of the first countries to start doing radio astronomy. Through the CSIRO, it has been involved since the 1940s, when the science really began. The CSIRO Division of Radio Physics had been set up in 1939 to work on radar. After the war was over, it started using its equipment to study radio waves coming from the sun at sites like this one at Dover Heights in Sydney. Soon the researchers turned their attention to the sky in general. They found other radio sources, some of which turned out to be galaxies beyond ours. Australian radio astronomy was up and running. During the 1940s and 50s, the CSIRO built a number of different instruments for doing radio astronomy. They were pretty simple by today's standards. But by the early 1950s, it was clear that the days of improvisation were over. It was time to think big. CSIRO began to plan the Parkes Telescope. The Parkes Telescope was designed by a British company and built by a German one. The turret and hub were built and tested in Germany, shipped to Australia and then reassembled. Work on the site began in 1959. Parks was opened in 1961 and has been working ever since with regular facelifts. But by the 1970s, it could no longer meet the desire of the radio astronomers to see things in greater and greater detail. Other countries had younger, sharper-eyed instruments. For Australia to keep up, it needed a new radio telescope, the Australia Telescope. And this time, we were ready to design and build it ourselves. Once again, the CSIRO Division of Radio Physics had the job of coordinating the design and construction. However, this was a much bigger job than building parks. The full Australia telescope consists of eight antennas spread over three sites in New South Wales. These eight antennas are used together in various combinations as one giant telescope. The parks telescope itself is now part of the Australia telescope. Another part, a new antenna, is at Siding Spring Mountain near Coonabarabran. And further north still, near Narrabri in northwest New South Wales, is the heart of the Australia Telescope. This is CSIRO's Paul Wilde Observatory. There are six antennas here. Five of them sit on a stretch of railway line three kilometres long, and the sixth is three kilometres off to the west. The telescope's design came from radio physics, but there was a lot of input from other astronomy groups around Australia, and indeed overseas. Right from the start, CSIRO was determined that the telescope would have a high Australian content, 80%.
the, the big feature of this is that it was going to be 80% Australian contra- content. Um, and this was a boast that we made. In fact, we, we met it quite easily. But for things like the antennas, which took about 40, 45% of the total budget, it was essential that we have that designed and built in Australia. The antennas were designed by radio physics and consulting engineers MacDonald Wagner, now Connell Wagner, and built by Evans Deacon Industries of Brisbane. Um, they're, they're extremely good antennas. I mean, that, that much is clear right now. They're very good antennas. And I guess whenever we take a VIP up there, the first thing we do is to load them onto one of these antennas and, and trundle down the track with it because you've got you know, 260 tonnes of steel sitting above you and it's like taking off in your automatic car. The whole thing just goes from zero kilometres an hour up to the maximum speed of four kilometres an hour very smoothly. You don't feel the structure vibrate, shake or do anything. It's just a very rigid structure. Now all that, uh, it's, it's a lovely good transport vehicle but it all tells you something about its use as a final antenna. It's very rigid, uh, just, just a lovely structure. The struggle to produce an excellent but low-cost system produced several innovations. One was a new way of making the accurately shaped surface panels with a bed of bolts which could be adjusted for the different curvatures of each ring of panels. Making the panels this way cost a great deal less than importing the technology. This new panel making process is now available to Australian manufacturers who build satellite earth stations. Apart from the antennas, radio physics designed most of the rest of the Australia telescope, bits that are less visible than the antennas but no less important. The civil work and the antenna work were subcontracted out via uh, McDonald Wagner who took over most of the design for civil and structural and mechanical work. The rest of it is, is solely CSIRO and that is all the electronics the, coming from the, the cooled front ends. Uh, down through the local oscillator system, the IF system, the fibre optic system, the correlator itself, the image processing, all that, the data and monitoring, is all CSIRO, it's all being done and designed in this, this building here. Another innovation was a new way to make the telescope's very large feed horns. These are the devices that convert the radio waves into electrical signals. Traditionally, they are machined out of solid aluminium, but radio physics made its large feed horns from aluminium rings and fiberglass, which made them both lighter and cheaper. Radio physics also came up with new designs for the feed horns, designs which are now used in the satellite dishes that Australia sells in Asia and the Pacific. One of the most critical parts of the system was a computer chip called the correlator chip. Each chip is a very large-scale integrated circuit with 50,000 transistors on it. There are more than 3,000 of these chips and they do the hard work of dealing with the data as they first stream in from the antennas. When it's going flat out, the correlator does two million calculations every second. The correlator chip was designed by Radio Physics and produced by Austec Microsystems in Adelaide. Radio Physics and Austec built on the experience they got with this chip to go on and design a powerful new data processing chip that's now sold by Austec. All this activity, all this design and construction took five years. Finally, in September 1988, the Australia Telescope was ready for its launching. We're set up as a national facility, and that means that many of the users come from universities and observatories throughout Australia. Uh, in addition, of course, to our staff of astronomers here in CSIRO. And then we expect to have users coming from all over the world, because it's a world-class instrument and the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. So there will be people doing projects, sending teams down from the Northern hem Hemisphere, either doing it in collaboration with us, um, or coming down and uh, doing their own experiments. It's the first major telescope in the Southern Hemisphere which can make images uh, of a kind which you've thought of mainly photographically before, but this uses radio waves, as you've described, to make images which are like photographs. But the AT is the only one in the Southern Hemisphere which can do this, and so the, the, the principal objective 
is to be able to look at the objects which can only be seen in the southern hemisphere and uh, obtain radio images with a sort of photographic detail. But how does the telescope actually work? What radio astronomers want is a telescope that will give nice, sharp radio pictures and the bigger a telescope is, the sharper a picture it makes. But it's not practical to build a single dish telescope more than a few hundred meters across. So radio astronomers have a few cunning ways of combining the signals from small antennas to mimic one big one. As we've already seen, the Australia Telescope has a number of antennas. Six near Narrabri, one near Coonabarabran and one near Parks. Together, the eight antennas can simulate a giant telescope 300 kilometres in diameter. The AT can be further enlarged by linking it up with other radio telescopes in Australia, such as NASA's dish at Tidbinbilla near Canberra and one run by the University of Hobart. What is the benefit of this link-up? Imagine we are far out in space, looking at the Earth from over the South Pole. We can see that as the Earth rotates, the antennas move in circles around the South Pole. But what's more, the antennas also sweep out circular paths around each other, thus simulating a gigantic, albeit sparse, antenna. In the 1990s, astronomers will be going further and putting radio telescopes in orbit around the Earth. These will be used, together with the ones on the ground, to form very, very detailed radio pictures of the hearts of distant galaxies. This technique is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI for short. Let's go in a bit closer and look at how highly detailed images are obtained from the six antennas of the compact array near Narrabri. Over a 24-hour period, these antennas appear to sweep out circles around one another. You can think of these paths as being parts of the surface of an imaginary giant dish. What astronomers do is observe for 12 hours, then move the antennas to new positions and observe for another 12 hours and so on. Moving the antennas fills in the gaps on the surface of the imaginary giant dish. All the time, the radio waves that fall on the antennas are being processed and stored in a computer. To completely simulate a single giant dish, the antennas would have to be rearranged many times. However, the correlation computer pairs the output of every antenna with every other antenna in the array. This means that only a few changes of spacing are needed to get reasonable results. Once the computer has put all the information together, you've got pretty much the same information that you'd get with a single six kilometer wide dish. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. That's with only six of the Australia Telescope's eight antennas. Adding in the signals from the upgraded Parkes Telescope and still more signals from the new antenna at Siding Spring Mountain near Coonabarabran greatly increases the obtainable image detail. How do the radio signals actually get turned into a picture? The, the signals themselves, as they come in, they're, they're bounced off the reflecting surfaces of the antenna and then are focused into a feed horn. They then go down to these, into these uh, very cold spots where our amplifiers are mounted. They're amplified some thousands of times and eventually they come out at a very much higher level than they, they entered into this apparatus. They are then what's called digitised and sent down fibre optics. Um, so when each antenna is parked, it actually is, is hooked up to an umbilical cord which carries four fibres. So there's something like 40 kilometres worth of fibre optic cable laid in the ground up there. You're only seeing part of the telescope, a lot of it is buried. Uh, and the fibre optic system carries this no, it's virtually 1,000 million bits of information per second back to the central site. And it does this for each antenna and it does it for each of four IF signals. So you've got four times 1,000 million bits of information times seven coming back to the central site. And it's all carried via fibre. The, the clue to the, the whole heart of the system then is, is what's called the, the correlator chip. Um, you have each antenna is pointing at the same spot in the sky. And <clears throat> when you finally get all the data back into the central building, most of what's coming back is noise that's generated in each antenna. Now that noise is, is what's called uncorrelated, it's random noise, 
the only thing that is common to all antennas is the bit of energy that's coming from the star. So when these um, outputs of each antenna is fed back to this main control building, the signals are then compared with one another. So every antenna is compared, output is compared with every other antenna's output. And as I said before, most of what you see is just random noise that's uncorrelated. However, there is one small part of it that is correlated, and that's the bit we're trying to extract. Now, the data flow rates are enormous, as I've mentioned before. There's 1,000 million bits of information per second from each antenna times four outputs from each antenna. So you've got to reduce this data flow, and you do this in this thing called the correlator. It's like a special purpose computer that does all this comparison and correlation early up and then reduces it to a, a level that a, a supercomputer can handle. Um, and it, it, it just chokes off this data rate. The data flow from the six antennas at Narrabri is dealt with on the spot, in real time. But when the antennas near Coonabarabran and Parks are added into the system, the data they collect will be recorded on special magnetic tape and the signals all brought together later for processing. Whether from Narrabri or the other sites, the whole mass of recorded information ends up at the Radiophysics Laboratory in Sydney to be processed and turned into pictures. The data are calibrated for phase and intensity and then turned into the first images, which still have lots of stray bits and pieces in them that aren't really there. This is because even though the Australia Telescope can simulate a very large dish, it still isn't one. These initial dirty images are run through programs that take these instrumentation effects into account and take out the lumps. Other programs can compensate for the way the atmosphere makes radio sources twinkle, just as we see the stars twinkling. And what you end up with are some very, very special pictures of the universe. <laughs>